So uh, the cavalry movement, um, just by show of hands, how many folks here have heard of it or know of it? Maybe sat through six or eight presentations of it. Um, there's a couple of folks in here. We have given this talk a lot before, um, but uh, the more we give it, the more we get feedback, the more uh, types of sessions that we do, the more we evolve the movement. And so we'll give you an update on, on all the things that are going on. Uh, my name is Bo Woods. Uh, you may have run into me a couple of places, uh, OWASP and HIMSS, mobile security groups. Uh, I've been active in those. Um, I'm a security advisor and consultant. I've been in uh, information security, IT security since 2005 uh, professionally. Um, as an amateur, you know, I've had lots of uh, problems on my systems at home and had to fix them for much longer than that. Um, and I am the cavalry too because there's a lot of other folks out there. Uh, many of the people in here are, uh, are cavalry. If you're not now, you will be conscripted by the end of the talk, uh, so just get ready to learn how to ride a horse. Uh, so the agenda, uh, why are we here? Where have we been? Where are we now? Where are we going and how can you get involved? Um, fairly straightforward, and again, if you've seen this talk, you've seen this a lot. Uh, this is what's going to be different today. Uh, just for one of our audience members who um, wanted to know what was gonna be different about today's talk rather than the ones we've done before. Um, so you're gonna hear my story and my perspective. Uh, you've probably heard a lot of Josh Corman and Nick Prococo who have given this talk many, many times as well as Adam Brand who gave it at LastCon. They've given their story, their perspective. Everybody has a slightly different one, but we're all converging towards the same, um, same place. Also give you an update on uh, what we've done to date, where we are, and where we're going as of right now, uh, and more on how you can help. Um, kind of carved out, uh, there's some exciting stuff that's just happened in the last week, and we want to tell you about it. Why are, why are we here? This is why I'm here. So my first week on the job in the information security field, I was super stoked because I was at a hospital and I was doing the security thing, which I really, really enjoyed doing. Um, I had come from an IT background and I, now I was doing security. We got a call um, because a bunch of machines were rebooting uh, and I went and did some troubleshooting, figured out it was a malicious software, a worm that was propagating around the environment and causing all these uh, machines to power off, power back on. Um, so that was a pretty big problem. We got it cleaned up, uh, and a few hours later, we got a call from the natal intensive care unit. This is where they take care of premature babies and other such things. Um, they were having some of their computers were still rebooting, except for these were medical devices. This is uh, fetal heart monitors, which monitors the baby's heartbeat so that when there's something erratic going on, the doctors can respond to it quickly. So it needs to do baselining and the computer reboots, then you lose the baselines, so you don't know what the, so you're falling back to medicine practices that were pre-computerized systems. Um, and so it was slowing down patient care, it was costing the organization a lot and putting patients at risk. Um, called the vendor, called the manufacturer, this particular device, and they said basically, um, it's malware, so it's, it's a, not a maintenance issue. It's something that's messed up on your side. Uh, there's nothing we can do for you. I said, okay, you know, let me get into the box. I'll fix it myself. I know how to do this. I'm a grown up. They said, no, we can't do that. That would void the warranty. And then we would end the maintenance contract. I said, so basically you're telling me that these boxes that we pay you to fix for us, you can't fix for us and you won't let us fix it for ourselves. So that was pretty much the, the story. Um, I didn't think that that was a good answer, so I worked with my boss at the time, and we put together a plan uh, to think like a virus and get on the box, um, fix it, and then reboot it and get rid of the malware. So I uh, took the plan to the CEO. The CEO approved it, said, right, I understand the consequences of not doing this and of doing this. And I'm going to sign off and say, go do it. You've got, you know, the, the get out of jail free card in case you break the medical devices. Um, so with a copy of Metasploit and about an hour, uh, I was able to fix six medical devices and let the doctors get back to doing what they're doing, saving lives. Um, as I've kind of gone through my journey in the information security world, I realized that I've, I had more of an impact in my first week on the job than I've really had in the rest of my career combined. Um, that kind of sucks, 
right? And as Michael was talking about earlier today, we all kind of have this, uh, this trajectory that we get on. Uh, and this is the, the Gartner hype cycle, but I've repurposed it for our career cycle because we really, ha we really do have this, right? We have the technology trigger that leads to our expectations. About right here, our passion for information security becomes our day job. And then we get let down. We go into that trough of disillusionment, which is followed by the rise of enlightenment and then continued productivity. But it sucks that we have to go through this. And for me, you know, on my best day as a security consultant, which I've done for a few years now, um, I'm making sure that, like, best case scenario, I help the people who own the company not lose as much money. And that's just not very satisfying. Um, it wasn't very satisfying for me. So when I started thinking about, you know, what really would change that dynamic, um, I started looking at what are the important things. Uh, and that's why I latched onto the cavalry so tightly is because the cavalry is about essentially uh, protecting three things, looking at, at information security from three different aspects. The body, you know, ourselves, our kids, um, medical devices that are now running on computers, cars that are now running on computers, and especially the work that, uh, for example, Charlie Miller and Chris Velasic demonstrated out at uh, Black Hat and DEF CON, where they hacked a car and were able to do all kinds of really bad things. Um, Internet of Things, you know, planes, trains, automobiles, all of this is running on computerized systems now. Um, mind is kind of the next step of that. It's uh, if you look at the security research that we do to find these issues, there's an increasing trend towards criminalizing that type of research. Uh, if you look at especially the uh, Weave case, where uh, he was able to essentially, by um, changing URL strings, was able to enumerate uh, a number of people's private information. Well, he's in jail now because he was typing on his keyboard and putting a new URL string in the, the URL bar. Um, and that's a trend that uh, we're probably not going to see reversing unless we do something about it. Uh, and then there's the soul aspect, what Robert was talking about this morning with um, the social contract having been changed because of technology, because people have the ability to do the types of surveillance um, easily and electronically, they are doing it. And we don't really get a say in that matter. You know, it's not just the United States. If you go overseas to places like Syria, to places like Iran, where the governments are cracking down and basically finding people who are um, complaining about the situation, they're pulling them out of the, uh, the homes, they're putting them into jail, uh, they're beating them, sometimes killing them. Uh, and that's not really acceptable. So the cavalry has really kind of started to address those three aspects. Moving a little bit towards um, the human life versus digital life. You know, Josh Corman came up with this index of replaceability. Uh, and he says, Look, we focus a lot over here on the side of the highly replaceable assets. We're spending billions and billions of dollars, right? I think Gartner, uh, last I saw, had said it was about $65 billion industry going towards an $85 billion industry. And the bulk of that is spent trying to protect these highly replaceable assets. And by all accounts, pretty much we're losing. Or uh, to say it the way that Bruce Schneier says it, we're getting worse faster than we're getting better. Uh, that's where we're spending a lot of money, time, and resources. Over on the human life side, we're not really spending much money, resource, and attention. Uh, it's just something that's gone unnoticed and it's crept up on us. Uh, so imagine how bad it might be there. This is another um, principle that Josh Corman has. It's around the defensibility of assets, the defensibility of systems, the defensibility of what it is we're trying to protect. So you start at the bottom with a defensible infrastructure. Uh, you want this, this platform to be strong, to be something where you can stand on it. And from there, you can protect yourself from what's going to come at you. Then moving towards operational excellence. Uh, this is things like um, having a good governance structure, good change management. Uh, there's been a lot of really good work done by Gene Kim and his institute. Uh, and I believe Gene is speaking this week. Um, 
And essentially, it comes down to the best security organizations are ones that do uh, operations very, very well, and they strive to get better all the time. Then you move up to situational awareness. This is what's out there, knowing what's out there, what's going to come and get us, knowing what's in our environment that maybe uh, has changed or that uh, we need to look at a little bit differently, but just knowing what's the current status. And then you get into countermeasures. What are the countermeasures that you put in place to prevent uh, bad things from happening to your assets? Right? So pretty well thought out, pretty good structure. Now, if you look at the submissions for conference talks, this is kind of how it breaks down. And it may be a little bit hard to read if you're in the back, um, but essentially on the rep replaceability index, everything's focusing on the most highly replaceable assets. And they're focusing on the top of the pyramid, the countermeasures, the things that you need to do last, rather than where maybe you might think it would focus on the things that matter most and the things you need to do first. So this is kind of a problem, right? This is, uh, if you look at uh, a lot of the talks um, that are coming in, maybe it's focusing on uh, anti-DNS repinning, which that's a problem, right? But on the scale of human life and defensible infrastructure, that's not really where the focus should be. You might win a Pony Award, but it's not gonna change the world. This is a conversation that came up this morning in one of the talks. You know, which browser is most secure? Um, I get asked this all the time. I'm sure you guys do too. That's one of the first things people ask when they hear your inf information security. Which browser is most secure? Should I use IE or Firefox or this OS or that OS? Um, I, I don't know. What's the answer to that? We, we can't really say, right? Aviator, that's right. More and more we're getting asked which phone is most secure. Uh, this is something that my mom asked me the other day. I'm looking for a new phone. Which one is most secure? Well, in your hands. Uh, <laughs> right, rotary phone. Now we start having to ask ourselves, which car is most secure? Josh tells the story about when he got done swimming with sharks, um, the apex predators. He got out of the, the water you know, still maybe a little bit shaky from being in the, the cage with 30-foot uh, sharks right outside of it. I don't know how big sharks are, but they're big. Um, and he walked back to his car and he thought, okay, this is a digitally connected, um, by which I mean exposed, software-driven, by which I mean vulnerable, piece of machinery that I'm putting my life in the hands of, of those folks. And he said he, he called up Chris uh, Velasic, who did the, the car hacking research, and asked him, you know, is this car that I'm in the one that you hacked? Uh, fortunately, it was not. But we shouldn't really have to ask that question, should we? I mean, um, getting out of the water with apex predators in the physical world, and now you're getting into apex predators in the digital world. If there's somebody who's in a, you know, um, let's, let's use the, uh, the aphorism, their parents' basement, who does nothing but spend all their time figuring out how to hack into things, now, you're connected to the internet in this car and you're vulnerable, you're exposed. You're in, the, you're in the same water as the apex predators of the internet. And that's maybe not a good thing. Which medical device is most secure? You know, if you watch Jay Radcliffe present at uh, uh, DEF CON and B-Sides this year, he's able to hack his insulin pump. That's probably not a very good thing. Um, the devices that he was using uh, have a remote control that even though his device and his remote control is 10 years old, uh, that company just released a new insulin pump. It has the exact same vulnerabilities and the exact same remote control. Things are not really getting better on this front. Which home control is most secure, right? As we're moving to the internet of things, you guys probably saw the other day there was an article that maybe it was true, maybe it wasn't, who knows, but refrigerators are now infected with malware and sending out a bunch of spam, right? Okay, again, we're, we're going to that like, who cares about some of this stuff? But if somebody could control your refrigerator, uh, shut it off at night so your fridge warms up, your eggs and your pork go bad, then they cool it down in the morning, you never notice. Well, you go and you have some nice bacon and eggs, you get sick and, and poison yourself essentially. Um, the Nest thermostats, uh, a few weeks ago, I think, there was a new firmware that they 
pushed out to all the, the thermostats, it caused it to randomly shut off in the middle of one of the coldest winters in the last 40 years. That's probably not a good thing, right? We're more and more bringing digital computerized technology into our life, into our lifestyle. And these are things that if we don't have security, then in this context, we lose safety. So information security and IT technological security really is safety when you get into this. So kind of the thought that a bunch of us always have when we talk about these things is, come on, somebody's got to be fixing this. This, this can't be a problem that nobody's thought about. Um, and so we wait around and don't really do anything. But the revelation is that well, maybe the cavalry isn't going to show up this time. Maybe there's not anybody who's going to ride in on horses at these medical device manufacturers and say, guys, I found it. It's safety, security. We've got to do these things. Otherwise, bad things happen. Um, maybe it's up to us. Uh, the scariest thought that probably all of us have is that we're the adults in the room in this conversation, right? We've got to be the people who are informing the decision makers on how to make well-educated decisions. Not force them to do something that they shouldn't be doing or that they don't want to do, but just let them know, here's what's going on. So where have we been? Um, it all started with a talk that uh, Nick and Josh gave at DEF CON and B-Sides Las Vegas. Um, and that's kind of where a lot of this uh, initiated. Now, they've done a lot of work before that around um, the replaceability index, defensibility. Uh, the burnout study that Josh and Jack Daniel did, which uh, directly relates to my life because I was burned out. I'm still kind of burned out with security. It just like, look, we look at all these things and they don't really matter. Um, nobody's getting verklempt about like Android malware, right? Nobody's getting choked up and, and like sentimental about this stuff. But human life, the things that really do matter, not many people are doing them. So this is the timeline. Uh, it started off at, at B-Sides Las Vegas at DEF CON. Um, we had a, a DerbyCon Congress, uh, and I'll go into more details on what that means, but basically get a bunch of hackers in a room, try and define what the problem is and how you solve it. Uh, talk at LastCon, Josh did a TEDx uh, in Naperville, AppSec USA. We talked at Blue Hat, got some of the elite hackers together um, who go up to Microsoft's campus every year. Uh, had a, uh, another one at, at ShmooCon, and, and here we are now. So as we've gone along, we've been narrowing the scope, the mission, the goals, down to what's reasonable, what's possible, and what's worth doing. At the same time, we've picked up a tremendous amount of participation and support. Um, tons of conference organizers have come to us and said, we really want you to come and, and give your talk raise awareness of this issue at your conference. We've had people coming from medical device manufacturers, car manufacturers. Uh, a guy hit the mailing list the other day, hey, I've got 25 years at BMW, I wanna help, right? That's the kind of participation and support we're getting, not just from hackers and activists, but from the community and the general public who are outside of, of us, the people who go to conferences. Uh, so it's been really, really great and it's on the rise. The journeys that we've had um, to now and kind of in the future. Um, again, we, we most of us have started as doing this as a hobby and we really, really liked it. And then we got into it as a profession and we got to that trough of disillusionment. And now for a lot of us, this has become our lives. This has become the thing that we wake up every morning and think about before we think about just about anything else. So it's consuming basically what we think about um, and that, that can lead us to, uh, a little bit of, a little bit of burnout, right? If you're not effective at what you think about every day, and many of us feel like we're not, then you just get burned out. You feel like it doesn't matter. A lot of really good, really smart, really talented security people have already left this profession. Um, for them, maybe that's the best thing, uh, because maybe, uh, that was going to lead them to a place that, you know, they couldn't come back from. Um, a lot of us are still here and we really care. And before we get burnt out, before we, you know, jump ship, uh, let's look at what we can do to change things. Finding that personal rock bottom leads you to 
in, in our case for the cavalry, leads you to reach out and find others. Uh, and that's what's been happening more and more, as I mentioned, the uh, great support we've been getting. We have a concept of bringing the people that we meet that have uh, like minds together to build kind of a guild, right? Uh, there's a really good presentation that Short Zero, Brian Kiefer did at um, uh, DerbyCon, where he compared uh, some of the things that you do in World of Warcraft, like building a guild, right? On your own, you can only kill so many monsters. You can only rise to such a level. But if you team up with a couple other people, you can take on bigger monsters, you can get bigger rewards, bigger, better quests. Once you start getting to the level where you're joining a guild, everybody has a role to play. You've got one guy that's farming gold, you've got another guy that's really good at crafting weapons, you've got another guy who's got power-ups and he's doing the fighting, right? You pool your resources, pool your talents together, and you're able to accomplish way more than you could as a group of individuals. So um, as we move forward, we're ironing out the mission, the goals, the plans, uh, and I've got a slide on that later. Um, and then you move towards executing, right? Getting things done, actually uh, making change happen. So what we've kind of converged upon in the conversations that have been going on in the mailing list at the conferences at all of these places is security as public safety and human life right that's what uh matters most on the replaceability index to most of us that really touches us i think everybody here probably has some story where um you kind of had a moment right where you realized that there's something bigger than just finding android o'day Escaping the echo chamber sandbox, getting out and talking to the muggles, if you will, right? The people who don't know the magic that we do uh, and who, who are just mystified by it. Getting out and talking to them, making it understandable, explainable, uh, so that they can understand the meaning behind it, even if they don't understand the technology. Uh, teaming up with stakeholders in the public, um, folks who are public policy um, setters. Uh, there was a, a senator who a couple of months ago sent a letter to the car manufacturers who sell cars in the United States and said, hey, did you see about the research that Charlie Miller and Chris, Chris Velasic did? Um, how do you respond to it? Do you think this is a real threat? What are you doing to make sure that they can't do that to your cars? And oh, yeah, all the other dozens of potential security threat vectors that are out there that become, at that point, public safety vectors. What are you doing? Um, that's still a, a pending open question, and he's getting responses from that. Um, so the, the ideas are out there in the public. Uh, we as a profession probably need to do something to help shape those ideas and to have an answer when people ask the question, what should you do? What should we do to protect ourselves? Um, that makes us the technically literate ambassadors of what we do, right? There's a lot of charlatans out there. We don't want those guys setting policy. We don't want those guys informing the policy makers who set policy themselves. Uh, we don't want some of the folks who uh, sometimes get on TV or promote themselves, but don't really have a clue what's really going on to be making those decisions for us because they're gonna, they're gonna do it wrong. Uh, a concept that we call fuzzing the chain of influence, which is in any decision-making process, there's a chain of influencers. There's a a string of people that you could potentially get to, to make a change in that. This is something that uh, Billy Rios found when he had 300 vulnerabilities in medical devices for a manufacturer. Um, the FDA couldn't do anything uh, because the manufacturer couldn't do anything, but he found through a side channel in the government, the Department of Homeland Security had a group through their uh, critical infrastructure that could do something. So they took it up with the manufacturer. They took it up with the FDA. And what happened? That information got released. The company sent out a letter to all their customers saying, we have this vulnerability. We have this issue. You need to know about it. Here's how to protect yourselves. The FDA issued a release that said, uh, here's this issue. If you haven't received a letter from the manufacturer already, you will soon. They also initiated a um, kind of a request for comments on best practice uh, guidance for medical device manufacturers to secure their systems, right? It wasn't great, but it was a great start. 
So we're getting results and we hope we continue to get results. That's the ultimate uh, measure of our effectiveness is if we're influencing change, if we're uh, getting the right information to the decision makers to change the way that the equations look. So at the DerbyCon Congress, uh, we had about 100 people. Uh, it was a room that fit 40 to 50 folks. And over the course of two days, we had standing room only for just about every session that we did. Uh, it was workshop format. Uh, so we went through um, and we were trying to define what is it exactly that we're talking about? What is it that we care about, right? It might have started as an idea in a couple of guys' heads, but there's the same concern with everybody out there. So let's see if we can define it more um, systematically, see if we can define it more precisely. Then we can find out what we think the root causes of that are. We might be wrong, but at least it's a place to start. Uh, then when we go out and start talking to people, we have an idea of where to start digging. Um, brainstorm on solutions, not just technical solutions. That's one of the big things that, that we came to realize through this session and I personally realized walking away from it is we got a lot of smart people in the room, but if we're just talking to ourselves, we're not doing anything about it. So what are the solutions to this? How do we work with uh, policymakers? How do we seed the law journals so that when a legal case comes up, they have some reference, even if it's not a legal precedent, they can still go back to something and say, here's why I made my decision. Uh, how do we do those things that drive effectiveness? Uh, and then we propose some next steps. The areas we covered, medical, automa automotive, legal, and then media. You know, changing uh, hearts and minds, winning the hearts and minds campaign. If you look at a lot of the media coverage out there, it's pretty negative uh, about hackers and about security research. There's a lot of bad ideas, a lot of bad publicity. Um, but there's also a lot of good articles out there. You know, everybody is uh, life hacking now. They're growth hacking. They're hacking this, hacking that, hacking that. Um, taking away the hacker word, uh, and, because that's in our community a little bit volatile. If you look at uh, the way that it's, it's defined, if now people can't say hackers are bad, they have to say criminal hackers are bad, then you might as well not even have the hacker term in there. It's just criminals are bad, right? So it's changing the way that we're seen in the public, public eye. Um, the outcomes were getting a lot, a lot of knowledge sharing. There were some people who showed up in that room uh, that were really, really smart, that were really plugged in to what's going on in the technology scene, but also in the public policy scene, in you know, medical device manufacturers, in uh, automotive, in helicopters. Um, so we got a lot of really good information out of that session. We also found that we had way more agreement than differences, where we kind of expected to have a bunch of people wanting to pull in this direction or that direction or the other direction, we found that most people uh, kind of came to a consensus around a very tight focus, and that was really good for us. That said that we were on the going the right direction. Um, and we found out that, that we really have to get out of the e echo chamber. We all know a lot of these issues, uh, but unless we're communicating and sharing our knowledge with the rest of the world, um, nothing's going to change. So at ShmooCon, we really tried to refine this. What is it that we're trying to say? What is it that we're trying to do to, to make an effect in the world? Um, and we've found that most people tend to really hone in on the public safety and human life message. Uh, that is, start with the body um, of the body, mind, and soul. Uh, medical devices, cars, transportation, Internet of Things, these are, these are things that resonate with everyone. People in this room, as well as if you walk out to the beach, people on the beach will be thinking about, you know, if you can make it, relatable to them and to their lives, they're really going to uh, jump onto it. That then drags the mind part, which is again, security research. If you can demonstrate that security research is critical, it's necessary, uh, it's very important to getting to the solution, then security research is not something that you shouldn't do and that should be illegalized. It's something that you should promote, but promote in a responsible uh, and coordinated manner. Um, and we also found out that most of the sentiment was that a lot of other folks are focusing on the soul aspect, that is the civil liberties, uh, the privacy, 
Um, the EFF, ACLU has started taking up the bandwagon uh, more strongly on the technology side of it. Um, there's a lot of groups that are focusing on this. And if we got involved in that, it would either suck some of their wind or get a little bit in their way. So we decided that the, probably the best course of action then is to start with the body, start with the public safety aspect, the human life aspect, let that get the research as a, a necessary thing, um, and that would be the best place to start. Um, one of our homework assignments was uh, to pick a fight with a total stranger and lose, right? The fight club homework assignment. What we mean by that is just engage with somebody, your hairdresser, right? Everybody has a hairdresser, right? We get you know, pimped and preened and um, go talk to them, make it relatable to them. And all of a sudden, you've now learned a lot that you can transfer to your daily life. Hairdressers, in terms of their technological expertise, aren't a whole lot different from uh, some of the executives in some of the companies that we work for. <laughs> and that's, that's not a knock on the executives, right? They shouldn't have to be as technically literate as we are. That's not their job. That's not their responsibility. That's not why they wake up every morning. If you can explain it, you know, the, the line I always use, if I can explain it to my grandmother, I can explain it to pretty much anybody. And if you start with that as your uh, goal and objective, then it's easier to communicate and make people understand why it matters to them. Um, we also had some really great information uh, and discussion with Katie Masuris, who's at Microsoft, and she's been sharing uh, or editing several of the ISO standards on coordinated disclosure. There's lots and lots of good information that you can look to and reference that you can bring to your company. And even if they're averse to security research, you can say, look, this is an ISO standard for how you um, have a coordinated disclosure uh, conversation with the researchers. And that can get a lot of organizations on board with something that previously they might not have wanted to. That's especially true as you move out of software development environments and into device manufacturing environments of which software is a component. Um, we also, we had a draft mission statement, which is what I want to start with on the where are we now. The draft mission statement says, to ensure technologies with the potential to impact public safety and human life are worthy of our trust. And we've done a lot of testing of this mission statement with people from inside the community and outside the community. Uh, we've been talking to them, we've been asking, we've been refining this down to something that is clear for people not in our community, but also clear for people in our community. So it's very specific, very targeted uh, for what we want to do and how we want to do it. Right now, we are preparing for um, a lot of stuff to go on in San Francisco next month. So the RSA conference is next month in San Francisco at the end of the month. Uh, around that is also a B-Sides event and then an event called TrustyCon. We're going to sp be speaking at all three of those events. Um, we have been very generously offered a big space at RSA to put on workshops for three days. So for three solid days, you're going to have security decision makers at the largest security conference in the world coming by and talking to us about uh, this type of thing, about getting involved, about changing the world, essentially. We think that that's going to be a great platform. And we're really excited for all of those different venues. So we're trying to put together uh, how we're going to do it, what we're going to do uh, to, to have the biggest impact. Um, we're looking at formal organization. You know, the movement has a certain momentum to it, but it's not actionable um, if there's not a good structure around which you can get things done. Um, we're not sure what that's going to look like, whether it's going to be a B Corp, a C Corp, a S Corp, a 5013C, a 501C6, a 501C4. There's so many different incorporation models that we've got to look at uh, to be able to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish. And some of that depends on the how we want to do it. Um, there can be multiple organizations that spring out of the movement, uh, not just one. So we're looking at many, many different options right now. We're also doing strategic planning for how is the best way to approach the problem? How is the best way to get the most effectiveness uh, with our time um, and the information, the resources that we have to bring to the problem? Uh, and we're accumulating and distributing information as best we can right now. One of the things we realized is connecting people is one of the biggest things that we can help to do, right? So there's a guy over here who's doing a certain kind of research and there's a guy over here who, would be uh, who it would be beneficial to to have that research. 
um, they don't always know each other. So if we can connect those folks, then it's a lot better. Uh, and we found that we're a really good clearinghouse. Like I said, we've had a lot of people coming from industry who have contacted us and said, hey, I work in the position that you need to get in touch with if you want to affect change. I would love to help you. Like, what can I do? Let's get on a call. Let's talk about it. Uh, I'm happy to take any ideas you have and, and help you with them. Um, so we've had really, really good success getting those connections made as well as getting information from people in industry, from people who have been doing research uh, and pulling it together. Um, that's probably the place where we need the most help uh, because, you know, that's a manual process right now of these people are coming in, these people are coming in, how do we hook them up with each other, how do we get the information out to everybody, um, but we're trying. Uh, where are we going? Well, first, let's start with where we're not going. This is the stuff that really won't ever work, to just say, well, we're techies, we're, all, we're geeks, we can't really do this, we can't, you know, help anything, nobody's ever going to understand it. Uh, so, yeah, stupid user problem, right? Um, we can't just say that anymore. If we're the adults in the room, and a lot of this is predicated on being the adults in the room in this case, um, we, we can't just say, well, we're going to stay in our little box and not ever do anything else. Uh, and I think that a lot of folks in this industry have realized that and known it for some, some number of years. So we're not getting too many people anymore coming up and saying, well, we're just techies. We can't really change the world. Um, we can't say screw them, right? Uh, stupid user pro. Oh, that's, you know, who cares? It's device manufacturers. Nobody loves them. Um, we can't do that, right? That won't work. If we want to change the world, and hopefully everybody does, that's not going to be the thing that does it. Uh, we can't give up and say that the problems are too big. Every problem is too big until it becomes too small, right? Or small enough that you can actually solve it. Uh, I heard one time, it's only impossible until the first guy does it, right? That's the same kind of thing. These are big problems, but uh, it's like eating the elephant or eating the rhinoceri, if you will. You've got to do it one bite at a time. You can't try and do it all at once. So what are some potential activities that we're looking to do? Uh, the how of, of how we affect change. Um, first of all, research, lots of research, policy level research, technical level research, architecture level research. You know, if a, a device manufacturer comes to us and says, hey, we want to change the way that we're doing our security development life cycle. Great. We've got the research to be able to support that. Maybe we can do more research to fit it into your current uh, device manufacturing model. Um, communication and outreach is a big part of this, right? Like I said, with changing media perceptions, winning hearts and minds. Uh, you've got to reach out to people. You know, if you make uh, a reporter's job easy, then essentially they're more likely to pick up your story and run with it. Um, by feeding them the way that we see ourselves, that helps the rest of the world see us that way too. That's how you win the war on, uh, you know, criminalization of research. Communicating not just to media, but to developers. Communicating to um, doctors. Getting doctors into this idea of medical devices are fallible. I've got a friend who's a doctor. He's one of the first people I talked to about this. Uh, and I was asking him some questions about, you know, what would it look like if one of these devices were failing in this way? Uh, and he thought about it for a minute and he said, you know what? It would look exactly like I would expect the patient's disease to go if it were going badly. So essentially, he realized that he would not know if it was the device that was failing or the patient's health that was failing. It was indistinguishable. That realization for him has sent him kind of into a tailspin. He's been going running around his hospital talking to all the biomedical device people that he can talk to about how do we know that these devices aren't failing? Do we have tests? Do we have logs? And it turns out that the answers are probably what you would expect in this room, but not what he'd expected. Um, collaborating with each other and with policymakers, with technology leaders, not just uh, computer technology leaders, but medical technology leaders, automotive techno technology leaders. Uh, if anybody in here knows Kyle Osborne, um, he works for Tesla. He's the uh, vulnerability guy uh, who does the corporate side of Tesla. Uh, a little while ago, he turned some of his focus onto the Tesla cars themselves and said, hey, cars run software, software is vulnerable, there's probably vulnerabilities in our cars. So he worked really, really hard, and he's done a lot of work to reduce the vulnerability of those Tesla cars. Um, if you saw it lately, uh, Tesla has re released the first that I know of, 
car manufacturers coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Unprecedented. You hack a Tesla and they're not going to send you to jail if you give them a chance to fix it. That's awesome. That's top notch. That's the kind of thing that once one car manufacturer does it, a lot of the others will follow suit because there's now a precedent for it. So collaborating with the people who are in the industry, who are in government, who are in agencies, um, as well as who have the power to change things. Talk to doctors, like I said. If you get a doctor interested in an issue, he's going to ask the chief medical officer, uh, who is himself usually a doctor or herself. They're going to go to the people that they buy from and ask that question. So you're going to, you're going to make this idea infectious, and you're going to use other people's minds and energy and resources to spread your ideas, which is a really good thing. Uh, and connecting people, like I said, getting researchers together with other researchers, um, having some common uh, essentially asset database of research that's been done before. So if, if somebody is doing one type of, of uh, studies, they don't have to repeat the stuff that was done before, right? Better use of people's time. Um, and so we're still refining who we are. Uh, we've got the draft mission statement. Um, we need to get more about our values, what we believe, you know, what we see the world being like, the world through our eyes, uh, and how that translates into what we want to do. Um, what is the nature of our organization or our, our movement? Uh, what form is that going to take and what's our core how going to be? Um, what is the vision that we want to see, right? Painting a picture of the next... 10 years, 20 years, I mean, thinking about things long-term, uh, that's what it'll take, but that's not a, a big deal in terms of time. If you buy a refrigerator that's got a computer in it, you probably expect it to last five to 10 years. If you buy a car, that's gonna stay on the road 10 to 15 years. An airplane is gonna stay in the air 30 years. So five, 10, 20 year thinking is kind of what we need, but we need to get started now. And then how do we make the change? What do we need to accomplish? Um, how do we need to do it? And by when? So how can you get involved? Um, I'm glad you asked. Uh, upcoming events, I mentioned RSA, B-Side, San Francisco, and TrustyCon out in San Francisco at the end of the month. Um, we're speaking at all three of those. Uh, if you're gonna be in the area, please let us know. Stop by, let's hang out, talk. Um, Source Boston on the other side, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, ThoughtCon in Chicago. So I know there's a couple of folks here who've uh, been talking about ThoughtCon already. Uh, besides Las Vegas, DEF CON, we just had uh, a potential opportunity to go to Hope, which is in July in New York. Um, so we may be at Hope. We may have a workshop at Hope. Uh, there's a lot of besides tracks that are in here that um, just they're in my email inbox. I didn't have time to put them on the timeline. So um, there's a lot that's going on. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to help. Uh, and if you've seen the DEF CON CFP tracks, which were just released on Thursday, this is what they are, right? Spy versus spy, Internet of Things, infrastructure, life safety, saving cyberspace. Well, Internet of Things and life safety is exactly what we're talking about here. So the hope is that DEF CON will give a lot of uh, people thought and spur a lot of research towards this stuff just by virtue of the fact that if you're not in one of these categories, you're not talking to DEF CON. Um, so we need, we need you, everybody in this room. I told you I was going to conscript you. Uh, so the horse riding lessons and, and, uh, assignment of spurs is going to be later on, uh, after the beer, um, people who have experience with manufacturers, device manufacturers, if you, you know, worked on embedded devices, uh, it would be great to have you, uh, come on board and tell us things that we don't know because we don't know at all. Um, if you've ever dealt with the media, I know there's several folks in here who deal with the media very regularly. Um, love to have your help trying to put together a press kit right now. And, you know, we don't necessarily know all the pieces that need to go into it. So how do you get that? Um, if you've got any lobbying or policy experience, that would be really good to have. We don't necessarily want to start lobbying, but we need to have that kind of thinking uh, because that's the kind of people we need to reach. Um, organization visual skills, if you can put together a better PowerPoint than this one, hey, please, you know, be my guest. Um, if you are a good project manager, we've got a lot of threads flying around. We need somebody to bring those together. Uh, or if you're just really passionate, 
right? We've got people who have come to us and said, I want to help. I don't have any special skills, but I have an insulin pump and I care about this. So um, we're looking for, for anybody. Uh, who can contribute? Pretty much anyone. Uh, breakers, builders, you guys are familiar with that. We're all breakers and or builders or were at some point in our lives, but also you know, private citizens. Uh, if your mom is super concerned about this, hey, send her to the mailing list, right? Um, if you have a friend who's a, a dentist and he's kind of shocked that his new, you know, whatever dentist you use has a computer in it, send him our way. We're, we're happy to take all comers, um, especially if you have a, a podium to broadcast from, podcasters. We've done lots of podcasts. And it's great to get that exposure, especially if you know somebody who has a podcast that's not in a security field. Um, now that there's like 800 security podcasts. I'm guilty because I've got like three of them. Uh, but now that there's... Uh, so many podcasts out there that aren't in the security field that we could potentially tap into. We'd love to talk to more people. Um, if you're selfish uh, and you just want to spend less time doing stuff you don't like, in the red is the stuff you don't like, which is you know uh, trying to make your your application vulnerability that you found matter. Uh, the blue is the time it takes to find the vulnerability in the first place. You can get a lot closer to the ultimate goal of getting attention for it, getting a CFP accepted. Uh, if you're closer over to the human life side, uh, I mean, you saw the slide previously where all the talks tend to center around, you know, Android application vulnerabilities. Um, conferences are sick of those. They'd much rather have uh, something that affects human life, something that's that's big picture impactful, um, as DEF CON has said. So I'll leave you with this quote. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has. Uh, and that's Margaret Mead. Um, so this is uh, how to get in touch with us. Uh, IontheCavalry.org. At IontheCavalry if you're on the Twitters. Uh, Google Groups, join the mailing list. You can see all the archived posts so you don't feel out of the loop. Um, get in touch with us. On the, uh, on the presentation uh, that is posted somewhere, uh, we'll have links to videos and podcasts, we can, which you can see here. Uh, I don't expect you to remember all the bit.ly links. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's the end of our program today. Thank you.